know, we were just discussing before the show the, uh, the the dream job. I mean, how many do you ask that question when you're working with somebody and you know they're coming to you for help on finding a job? Does that come up? It it uh, it does, uh, particularly since it's a good idea to try to and, and we've talked about this before, but it's a good idea to try to get in touch with what someone's passions are work wise. Obviously, the ideal situation for anybody is to is to do something for work that is really fulfilling to you and really has meaning, which unfortunately for the great majority of us is not always the case. Um, but when you can, or it has its moments. Sure, but when you can do that, when you can, and and, and the re, and the, the you know kind of like the topic that I wanted to talk about because it's been coming up so much more over the last few years, maybe a little bit less lately as the economy has, has gotten a little bit better and the job market in particular in Seattle has gotten better, um, is transition resumes. So I, I do get a lot of requests for folks who uh, have done some one thing for 15 years and now they've decided they want to completely get out of the industry they've been working in. And the reason that kind of the dream job thing tends to come up in these situations is this it's a one, it's a wonderful opportunity for folks in that position to say to themselves is there something i've always wanted to do and is this now a great opportunity to sort of pursue that and then how do i go about doing that and how often do those dream jobs uh, come into reality and and i want to get into like the reasons maybe people change and you know how to get get into that dream job but i mean do they become a reality very often um well you know he, he, or is the grass he, just he, always what, is the grass always green? Or like that's yeah, my dream job, and right. then you realize that here's here's what happens more often than not. Just like anything else in life, you're right. Kind of the grass is greener sort of thing, but but folks tend to have this sort of idealized concept of what that g- dream job is and what actually you do when you have that particular job, and sometimes. What someone has in their mind is, is, is a bit different from what reality actually is. And so if you are in that situation where you are transitioning, it's more important than ever to really do that research and find out what is a person who does this job actually do day in and day out? Because in every job, there's parts of it that are sort of the grind parts of it. Yeah, I mean, and, I, and, oh, yeah. Go ahead. and you've got to be able to, to handle doing those things you know, to kind of get to the other parts that might be more meaningful for you. And so you don't want to take a job that you think is one thing, but it ends up being another thing. So how do you, like, find out? Now, if you really are doing something that is a fairly severe transition or seems to be something very, very different, a great thing to do sometimes is to do is to contact a company and talk to a decision maker there, and maybe even over the phone, maybe even you don't have to do it in person, but do an informational interview with them and really ask them the probing questions to find out what does someone do in this job? Not only that, but what are you looking for in a candidate that does this job? Because that's how you're going to be able to position your resume. Because you want to you want to write the things in your resume they are going to have meaning to the person reading the, reading it. So. Yeah, and I mean, imagine that there are so many, like you call them the grind. I mean, there's people who are like, I wish I was just a real estate agent with the flexibility of schedule. Right. But really, they're out showing houses at 7 on o'clock sun, at it's night. Sunday, uh, yeah. On Sunday at 7 in the morning. Right, exactly. and it's, you know, it's very difficult for maybe people to understand that, no, you you're completely don't have your own schedule. Or in, or in particular, as a real estate agent, you know, the first few years, you've got to work like almost all the time to build up that client base. Right. And, you know, the rewards are unbelievably great or can be, but you've got to really, really work for those first free few years. And you, maybe you've watched like Million Dollar Listing or something on, on Bravo, right? And so you have this like idyllic, this sort of idealized image of how, you know, fancy free and blah, blah, blah this is. And you're just getting these million dollar commissions right. that are coming in on these, you know, ridiculously giant purchases. Sure. But how do you get to that level? Right. Getting to that level is the thing that you have to endure and, and, and be ready to endure. And that's yeah. kind of the same in any p- position, right? Because undoubtedly, if you're going to go through some type of crossover, you're probably going to start mid level best. I mean, you're not going to the, you know, unless I guess you're like At CEO most, going yeah. to CEO, but then exactly. it's not really a. So exactly, you've got to be ready. Like, let's say you've, uh, and if you've been in, if you've done something else for 15 years, you've probably, you, you may have ascended to a certain level in that profession, 
But you're right. You really do have to kind of eat that slice of humble pie and realize that you might have to go down several notches, if not all the way to the, to the beginning. To the mailroom. And then you know what they do. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, that will really tell you, is this my passion? Because if it really, really is, then maybe you are willing to start over again. And folks, and folks actually do that. But you have to find out, what am I going to actually have to do? So when you start, once you find that out, I mean, how do you build a, a resume around it if you've essentially never done that? Sure. It's a, a lot of it. Okay, so... I mean, really, half the battle is is deciding on a on a type uh, on a style of resume that you're gonna create that you're gonna use, and so you got to get back to the simple concepts of what is a resume. And so, resume is, is essentially a sales flyer for what you offer as as a as a worker as an employee. Okay, so then you have to ask yourself. I am trying to present myself in the most impactful way, in the most salient way I possibly can. How am I going to do that? Well, if I'm transitioning careers, a traditional reverse chronology resume is really not going to be the way to go because that is going to more emphasize what you've actually done in your individual jobs in the past 15 years, which may not directly have anything to do with what you now want to be I would imagine all of a sudden forward. you're looking at that resume right. going, this guy has no idea what we're right. doing here. Exactly. So. It might, the, the version that you end up ultimately creating might contain almost exactly the same information or 90% of the same information, but you're presenting it differently. So just like if you were selling a vacuum cleaner that, had, that didn't have as good of suction as the leading competitor, you're not going to talk about the fact that it doesn't have suction in, in 75% of the, of the thing that you're, of the marketing material that you're creating. Similarly, you're going to probably go with more of a functional format on your resume that is going to focus on those transferable skills and accomplishments in your prior work history that in some way relate to what you want to be doing going forward and in some way show what skills you already have and have already used that relate to this new thing you want to be doing. And you make that the, the focus of it. And then towards the end, you just you simply list the positions you've had, and you you downplay the emphasis of what your actual work chronology has been. So downplay where you di- what where you've been, but upplay what you did. Exactly, upplay upplay the fact that you'd be able to make. You're trying to sell the idea that you'd be able to smoothly make this transition because you've done X, Y, and Z. Great example, recent client of mine has been a, a casualty adjuster. Okay, that, That's the most recent experience that, he, that he's had. His schooling was actually in PR and advertising. You know, So out of, out of college, he wasn't able to get a job doing that, so he took a job as a casualty adjuster. He's been doing it for like you know, five years or something like that, right? Well, the thing that's really cool is that if you, if you look at what a casualty adjuster, he adjusts auto accidents. So he's the guy, when you call your insurance company, you've been in an accident. He's the guy you talk to that takes down all the details of the accident. He does the investigation, et cetera, et cetera. He explains the coverages to you. He ends up paying out based on the policy, based on the coverage that you have on your policy. That, in a nutshell, it's what a casualty adjuster does. Okay, When you work for an insurance company, and basically you're, you're, a, you're someone who is a front lines person dealing with customers, you are the face of that company. When someone has dealt with you on a claim, Basically, they associate everything that they know about State Farm Insurance or whatever company it is based on the interaction they've had with you. So essentially, you're like a PR representative for that company, and how you handle the situation is going to really shape what that person thinks about the insurance company that you represent. So maybe maybe it's a stretch, but in a sense, you've been doing it. And in a sense, because people's perception of insurance might not always be positive. Let's face it. A lot of people think that an insurance company is trying to do everything they can do to not pay you, right? Aren't they? Well, the extent to which you can illustrate to them that this is the contract, this is the coverages that you signed up for, this is all that I can legally pay you. In fact, the insurance commissioner would not even allow us to pay you something different because this is the contract that you have. And so being able to explain that to somebody, you're doing like a PR job. You're doing like a PR job for the insurance company because you're sort of like telling them, you're explaining how it actually works. 
they might not buy it. <laughs> no, but, but, but it but makes yeah. sense. I like it. I mean, you right. know, I'm, I like to speak in analogies, and that does. Seem, it seems to work. And right. I guess if you're able to tell that story in a resume to somebody, I mean, I imagine that uh, uh, somebody who's reading it is going to go, okay, yeah, I get it. Like, right. And it's almost more practical than maybe writing press releases. Exactly. So, you know, the person has not been a PR person before, but they've done something in their job that is we can illustrate is somehow related. And let's say they've done it really well and they've won like all these awards, like there's, there's been customer feedback and they've gotten a 95 percent score and people have put comments in there saying this guy was really great at explaining it to me. I now understand insurance, blah, blah, blah. OK, those are indicators that this guy is pretty good at presenting um, you know, a good face of an, of an organization. You know, we talked about dream jobs just a, a little bit ago, and I imagine, you know, going into these new jobs, there may be other things that tie in. I mean, if you're going through a, a full career switch, right. there could be, I guess, like volunteer stuff. I mean, there must be all sorts of different exactly. things you've done with your in your life right. that maybe that maybe tie in. I mean, I know ho- I never would think of hobbies as being a big one, but like, you sure. know, if it's something that's competitive, maybe you're a competitive softball player and you can tie that in somehow. Right. Exactly. So in in this particular type of resume, when you're doing a transition, you are going to want to look for every possible opportunity to illustrate that you've done things, even if it wasn't necessarily in your in your work life, that somehow show a passion for this or show that you have the transferable skills that indicate you might be able to learn quickly or be successful in the role. I would usually tend to downplay the personal side of things in a resume because you don't want to divulge things about yourself that are going to open. I like cats. They're going (laughs) to, yeah, I I, I hoard cats. No, you don't want to divulge things about yourself that are going to maybe be open to interpretation that might be negative or, 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 you know, certain forms of hidden prejudice or or whatever. Sure. You know, nothing like religious stuff or political stuff you don't want to talk about. So I tend, I generally tend to say stick to work. Don't talk about personal stuff. But if you've like volunteered, let's say you want to be a web developer. Um, What a, a great thing to do would be like doing some web development work on the side for like a nonprofit, like a church or a nonprofit or a small business, maybe a friend of yours who owns a small business, you do it, you get the practical experience, and in that case, you could actually point them on, a, to a place on the web where you've done the website. Who cares whether you did it for free or not? Right. You got the experience, and you showed that you actually had the passion to do it, and you actually know how to do it. Are there a lot of people going into web development? What's that? Are there a lot of people going in that you see like transitioning to web development? It seems like such a mature, right? Like, oh yeah, yeah I built a WordPress site, and now I'd like to be a developer for Amazon. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I I do see some people. I do see some people doing it now. Usually, it's going to be somebody who's already been in IT in some way, and mm-hmm. they just want to they want to more specifically focus on web development. You're right. It's not usually somebody who's never done anything with computers well, before. Yeah, yeah, and the reason I ask, we do have yeah. to go to break in a minute because that's one of those things where a lot of people who maybe aren't after their dream job or after mo- a money job. Right. And there's so much money in this city that goes towards development. Absolutely. But it's not like you wake up one day and like, dude, I'm just I'm going to be a computer developer. Right. I mean, it's it, it's a pretty a pretty knowledge heavy role. Absolutely. You're not you're not just jumping on an assembly line. Right. So yeah, those those tend to not be somebody who never had anything to do with it before. But there are some people who have taken a bunch of classes on their own and they've learned how to do it. I've had those folks before and they want to get into it. And, you know, obviously that's a real challenge because if you haven't worked in that industry, it's real tough to kind of jump into that head first. That's where it's ext- – if, you, if you're trying to get an entry-level job doing that, it's extremely important to show those places where maybe you volunteered mm-hmm. or you've taken – let's say you've taken some kind of Microsoft certification. You put that obviously on the resume and show that you have that knowledge. Mm-hmm. <laughs>